Greetings, I'm your host, Dr. Wolfielan. When I'm not seeking revenge against camp counselors for the death of my mother, eventually forgetting my original motivation, and killing people in general for no reason, I'm here at the Wolfie Lair reviewing movies. Well, it's finally happened, folks. After 11 years, I am finally finishing the Friday the 13th series with a review of Part 7, The New Blood. Well, at least it didn't take me 13 years to finish this series, and since there won't be any more Friday the 13th movies made, I'll probably end up re-reviewing them eventually. At least the new line films, just to make fun of. In all seriousness, you're probably wondering why it took me so long to finish the Friday the 13th series, and why I covered them in a seemingly random order. Well, you see, this channel was originally intended to exclusively make fun of bad movies, so I prioritized making videos of the worst Friday the 13th movies like Jason Goes to Hell. Then eventually things opened up to me making actual reviews of movies I liked, and I love the Friday the 13th series. I was supposed to review Part 7 multiple times over the years, but it always got lost in the shuffle due to various misfortunes. I don't know if you've noticed, but I've been a lot more on the ball creating videos in recent years than I was in the first eight, and I sit here before for you finally ready to discuss Friday the 13th Part 7, The New Blood, at great length. Released in 1988 on an actual Friday the 13th, The New Blood is, for a lot of reasons, a key film in the franchise, but it exists in an awkward place in the series, during a time of transition when slasher films were fading in popularity. There were eight Friday the 13th movies in the space of ten years, and there was an unusual two-year gap between Part 6 and 7. Friday the 13th Part 6, Jason Lives, is a fan favorite today, but it was the most expensive Friday the 13th film at the time, and also the least profitable at the box office at that point. The choices of adding humor and reviving Jason as a supernatural zombie received mixed responses at the time. Meanwhile, the Nightmare on Elm Street series was increasing its box office numbers with each installment, making double what Friday the 13th movies were making. Freddy Krueger was more than just a horror icon in the 80s. He was a veritable star with mainstream appeal, despite being a child murderer. Freddy was a dynamic character backed by a unique concept, brimming with personality and a dark sense of humor, embodied by an actual actor in the form of Robert England. Jason Voorhees, in contrast, was treated mostly as a murderous prop by Paramount. Any sense of character and backstory he had in the first two films diminished with each installment, and he was played by different stuntmen each film up to part six. Jason, as great as his kills and presence are, was a mute masked slasher villain amongst a legion of mute masked slasher villains in the 80s, but you couldn't duplicate Freddy or Freddy's success, so Paramount figured, if you can't beat him, join him. Part 7 was originally conceived as being Freddy vs. Jason 15 years before it would actually happen, a crossover between Freddy and Jason that would hopefully raise Jason's profile and bring him success to match Freddy's at the box office. Of course, Paramount didn't own the rights to Freddy, New Line Cinema did, and it rings a bit of desperation that Paramount, stuck in second place, approached New Line about a crossover with Freddy. Paramount suggested that they split distribution duties. Paramount would handle the U.S. release of Freddy vs. Jason, and New Line would handle the international release, but the reality of the situation was that Paramount wanted Freddy, wanted to run the show, and wanted most of the money, but New Line didn't need Jason, at least not yet. So a deal wasn't made, and Part 7 had to go a different way. Associate producer Barbara Sachs's initial idea for Part 7 was that it'd be reminiscent of Jaws, where a real estate developer tries to build condos at Crystal Lake by covering up Jason's murders, but series executive producer Frank Mancuso Jr. balked at the idea. Instead, screenwriter Daryl Haney successfully pitched an idea for Part 7. Haney would later go on to mostly write a lot of softcore pornography in that movie about the kid who was strapped to a chair for 10 years. Haney's idea for Part 7 was simple and high concept. What if Jason had to fight against a psychic girl? As Barbara Sachs summed it up, Jason versus Carrie. Daryl Haney almost immediately got the job to write the film, but Barbara Sachs had very weird ambitions for the movie. She wanted it to be good enough to win an Academy Award, and she sought high-profile directors to helm the movie, even approaching Federico Fellini, insanely enough. Eventually, Sachs got a reality check and hired the late John Carl Beekler to direct, who was mostly a special effects artist, but was starting to make a name for himself as a low-budget horror-slash-fantasy director. As an effects artist, Beekler was a perfect choice to direct a Friday the 13th film, seeing as the franchise was basically a magic act, showcasing people dying, pretend, but convincingly gory deaths. It was cutting out the middleman having a director with effects talent, and Beekler injected Part 7 with his expertise in the field, but he experienced more than a few 
problems that held his vision back. I'll break those setbacks down and more with my review of Friday the 13th Part 7, The New Blood. Part 7 begins kinda unusually for a Friday the 13th movie, with an actual recap of the series instead of having a character just slow things down in the middle to explain who Jason is. They say he died as a boy, but he keeps coming back. Part 4 had a recap, but this one has narration over it, voiced by, in his final role, Walt Gorney, who played Crazy Ralph in the first two films. Some have even tried to stop him. No one can. The narration makes the opening feel like you're watching a trailer for Jason Lives, and it does kind of end up making you miss part six, especially knowing that this is the last canonical cinematic portrayal of Tommy Jarvis. Yeah, after part six, I guess Paramount got tired of having to constantly recast and retcon Tommy's character, and I think ditching Tommy's character is the sole reason why part seven is called The New Blood. It's the start of a new storyline, but not really. People forget, he's down there. Waiting. The film begins a short time after the events of part six. You can tell because the sunken Jason still has those snazzy yellow gloves. Please don't drink anymore. Don't tell me what to do. A little girl named Tina flees her home by Crystal Lake after her mom is hit by the drunken cream-colored windbreaker-wearing dad of the household, leading to Tina recreating the ending of Godfather Part Two, with her father playing the role of Fredo when she uses her psychic powers to fuck her dad's shit up, choosing in the heat of the moment to live with the childhood trauma of murdering her own dad over the childhood trauma of having a dad that beats her mom. No taxi backsies Tina, your dad seems like he sucked anyway. Fuck him. Part 7 jumps ahead 7 years, but here's a fucked up thing I've never really discussed. The Friday the 13th franchise's timeline has a lot of time jumps. There's a 4 year gap between the original and Part 2, a 5 year gap between Part 4 and Part 5, and then a 7 year time jump between Part 6 and Part 7, meaning Part 7 takes place in 1997, 9 years after this movie was actually made. So essentially, the Friday the 13th series takes place in an alternate universe where 80s trends lasted for 20 years. It's just one of those oversights you miss when you're writing a horror movie franchise on cocaine. At some point during the seven years after part six, they quickly changed the name of the town back to Crystal Lake from Forest Green for some reason. The main character, Tina Shepard, played by Laura Park Lincoln, which I can't believe is a real name, is a traumatized teenage girl with psychic powers fresh out of the psychiatric hospital. Tina's being taken by her mother to the childhood lake house where Tina kills her dad, where she'll be treated by her psychiatrist, Dr. Cruz. Why am I seeing things? I don't know, Tina. Why do you think you're seeing things? Simultaneously, there's a group of teens next door who are partying for the weekend. Yeah, uh, besides the telekinetic girl, Friday the 13th Part 7's premise is a mix of both Friday the 13th Part 4 and Part 5. You have a traumatized main character who's going through some mental health issues related to their past. They think they're seeing things that turn out to be real. Meanwhile, there's a group of partying teens next door that the main character's family becomes entangled with once Jason arrives on the scene killing folks. Honestly, I expected a movie with Part 7 in the title to be more original than this. With the teens, there are about 10 or 12 or 14 of them. It's hard to keep track of all these peripheral characters. They aren't all established at the beginning, so every time you think you know all the characters, two more teens are introduced. Did you see the way David just looked at me? Like with any other Friday the 13th movie, I couldn't tell you the names of any of the characters besides the main character. You weren't supposed to get attached to them. They're gonna be murdered like 10 minutes later. If this is my uncle's house, why are we sleeping in the van? Says we're sleeping. <laughs> I do admit, though, for how thinly characterized and large in number the cast is, most of the teens are at least a different stereotype each with their own tiny character arcs so they can stand out. You've got the mean rich girl Melissa who becomes jealous of Tina when Nick here becomes attracted to the psychic girl because, let's face it, crazy chicks are easy. Just make sure you have protection. Tina, wait a minute. Come back here. Who is that girl? Let me tell you something about women. You've got the nerdy Star Trek fan fiction writing dude with ADHD who would have been jacking off to anime and posting Elon Musk memes on Reddit if this was today. The entire galaxy is populated by highly evolved protozoa. There's the nerdy grandma looking girl who's horny the whole movie trying to fuck the stoner dude, but the stoner dude ends up fucking the red haired chick and that's all you really need to know about her character. You wanna get high? There's also two more couples in the house whose only real defining characteristics are that they're couples, but let's be real though. these. Two 
two guys are fucking. Actually, quite a few of the cast members in this film were gay, including the male lead, Kevin Spiritus. So the film was nicknamed by fans, Fry Gay the 13th. The other Friday the 13th movies are nicknamed Fry Straight the 13th. There are even more characters in the movie I'll get to later, but yeah, the movie has a large amount of characters for the sake of the body count, but the huge number of victims may have led to Part 7's downfall, which I'll get into later. Once again, Teen is a psychic chick, and her doctor wants to play Professor Xavier by fostering her abilities whilst Teen is grappling with some traumatic memories in the house while her ma's giving her shit. It makes Tina dash off to the lake where she wishes her father was still alive to beat some more sense into her mother. But instead, Tina unknowingly wills another violent psychopath back to life. Jason Voorhees, who's lost his yellow gloves and is left with a tattered jumpsuit that leaves nothing to the imagination. I honestly didn't know psychics also had the power to bring the dead back to life, but you learn something new every day. As Jason arises from the lake once more to kill the fuck out of adults in their late 20s playing teenagers. Jason is played for the first time by Kane Harder, a renowned stuntman and a fan favorite Jason performer who has become synonymous with the character, being the only actor to play him more than once in a record four films. Now, are most of the Kane Hodder Friday the 13th movies the worst of the series? Yes, but uh, Hodder's performance as Jason more than makes up for this fact. Hodder brought a consistency to Jason that the series lacked up to this point. You could sense a silent rage inside Hodder's Jason, a slow but brutal intensity in all of his actions. Jason's breathing even seemed to be angry. The Kane Hodder Jason is a dude who's pissed to still be alive, but too pissed off to die, taking it out on whoever he encounters. <laughs> Jason's look in this movie is also probably the biggest highlight. It's an ultra gritty portrayal of Jason where he has severe decomposition. Jason looks like a battle damaged action figure. It's really cool. John Carl Beekler's take on Jason is intricately detailed where it's easy to tell that there's a rich history behind every scar. Like he isn't just a dude who's deformed or a zombie. He's a guy who has endured decades of abuse and just keeps going. A sort of weird aspect of Jason in part seven I noticed this viewing was that they actually added a breathing sound effect over him. It sounds like the creepy kind of breathing though, like you're listening to the Crypt Keeper peeping on a women's locker room while jacking off. <sighs> Now, Friday the 13th Part 6 was actually pretty heavy on plot, for a Friday the 13th movie at least, but Part 7 is a return to the plots being loose. Sure, there's the drama over Tina dealing with her trauma and psychic abilities, but the psychic stuff is pretty much just set up for the final act. For most of the movie, Tina's just moving shit a few inches, and sometimes you even forget she has psychic powers. There are some little bits where Tina does suffer some further abuse that sends her to the edge. She becomes convinced that Jason is around, but Dr. Cruz decides to hide the evidence of Jason and gaslights Tina, essentially. Your psychokinesis and these delusions are just all tied together. Tina's mental state is even made a mockery of by the bitchy Melissa and even that fucking nerd who's one to laugh. Wow! All the teen characters that show up in this movie beyond the main couple, Tina and Nick, have absolutely no impact on the proceedings in this film, so let's stop beating around the bush and just break down all the murders in Friday the 13th Part 7, The New Blood. Of course, Tina's abusive dad died, and there's absolutely no way he can come back and redeem himself. The movie would be giving mixed messages otherwise. The first actual murders in this film happen an agonizingly long 18 minutes in. A couple has car trouble, and it turns out the guy here, Michael, is the birthday boy that the teens across from the Shepherds were planning to surprise with a party. What are you talking about? This is supposed to be a surprise party for your birthday. Everybody's waiting for us to show up. I got this great cabin and everything. Little bit of trivia about Michael here. He's played by William Butler, who is, to my knowledge, the only actor to have appeared in three of the big four horror franchises of the 70s and 80s. Friday the 13th Part 7, of course, Leatherface, The Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3, and in two episodes of Freddy's Nightmares, the short-lived Freddy Krueger anthology series. Butler just hasn't appeared in a Halloween movie. Yet. Anyway, Jason puts his amateur lepidoptery to work on Michael's girlfriend and goes all zombie ninja on Michael's ass. Ah, killing a dude on his birthday? That's fucked up, man. The next murders are another mostly unrelated couple stuck in the woods, and before this chick is ready to handle this dude's wood, he's gonna have to gather some wood first for a fire. I'll debark. Now, you'd think Jason would just use this guy's own machete on him, but no, instead Jason turns this man into a human hand puppet. Makes you wonder why he ever even uses weapons. The next kill is probably the highlight just for how simple and effective it is. Okay, you big hunk of a man, come and get me. 
Jason picks the girl in the sleeping bag up like a sack of potatoes and flings her in a tree, killing her instantly. Now, the sleeping bag kill originally had Jason swing the girl into the tree six times instead of just once, but the additional swings were cut out because, realistically, the chick's head would have been a lot more fucked up being bashed in six times by Jason. The interior of the sleeping bag would have been goo. This movie had a lot of cuts forced on it, which I'll get into, but this wasn't one of them. Honestly, though, even after one swing, I feel like her head should be more fucked up than this. Yet another couple is next on the chopping block. We got a lot of characters in this movie, so you gotta kill as many as possible in pairs. We got this douchey dork here wearing a sweater around his shoulders with the arms down to his waist, which makes it seem even dorkier. And his girlfriend, the blonde, who skinny dips. Man, this movie has a lot of butter faces in it. This is one of the few remnants of Barbara Sachs' original plan for this film to rip off Jaws, but in this movie, you see basically everything. This may or may not be the only time you see somebody's taint in a Friday the 13th movie. I don't know for sure, I'm not keeping count. Jason asks his sweater guy a question, and literally seconds later, Jason teleports underwater, pulling the girl down below to her unseen death, and eventually Jason drags her back up with a seriously bad case of mud butt. Yeah. The nerdy girl is dead set on getting laid by a dude who wouldn't accept her for who she is, and she gives herself a makeover and a, uh, mullet. Hockey hair is definitely sexy. Need a little touch-up work my ass. For whatever reason, she instantly assumes the dude she wants to fuck is hanging out outside, deep within the woods, where she loses her earring, which she eventually discovers directly below a dead guy. <laughs> Why is she running? This is a dude she'd actually have a chance fucking. The nerdy chick flees to a nearby shack where she's killed by a cutaway. I think you might be seeing a theme with this movie's kills by now. At this point, literally three sex scenes happen simultaneously, all in the missionary position. The hottest of all sex positions. We all know which of these three couples Jason is going to kill first. The couple in the van, because they're outside. It's more convenient. Jason grabs the dude's head and crushes it like he's juicing an orange. You know, if you use your imagination. And his girlfriend gets a little birthday surprise right in the eye. Again, if you use your imagination. Alright, you might be wondering why this movie isn't showing any of these kills. I'm getting to it, I'm getting to it. Meanwhile, the stoner and the redhead have just managed to somehow fuck despite being extremely inebriated on alcohol and drugs. Ooh. So the film decides to rip off, I mean homage, John Carpenter's Halloween by having the boyfriend go downstairs to the kitchen but for a sandwich instead of beer, since he's already wasted anyway. The kill itself, even if we saw the gore, doesn't really have the finesse of Carpenter and Dean Cundy's take on the similar premise, but thankfully Jason doesn't dress up as a sheet ghost when he kills the redhead by tossing her out a window, which Jason has already done in part four, but it was cooler then, because it was raining and the girls smashed a car on the way down. Savage as fuck! Yeah, kinda savage. Anywho, back to more fucking. Well, Melissa attempts to fuck the dweeb here, but she just can't do it. She can't even pretend to enjoy sex like 99.9% .9 of heterosexual women. Why'd you lie? You know, make him jealous. Melissa was just trying to get Nick jealous in the hopes that Nick would swoop in and cave the nerd's head in. Rejection. The nerd, rejected, dejected, and full-on erected, descends down to the living room to do what nerds do best. Play electronic games in his underpants. Jason pretty much kills this guy out of pity. You can tell Jason's crying under that mask. Jason was a mentally handicapped, hydrocephalic, bald kid, but he somehow found someone worse off than him. Okay, now why does this Friday the 13th movie not show blood or gore most of the time? Isn't the whole point blood and gore? Well, you see, the Friday the 13th series became a big target of forced MPAA censorship in the 80s. The original Friday the 13th was released mostly uncut and ended up becoming a big hit and a poster child for the emerging slasher subgenre. Consequently, the MPAA received backlash from parental groups over the decision to give the first Friday the 13th a supposed easy pass with an R rating. So the Friday the 13th sequels had a much harder time entering theaters with R ratings. Part 7 was no exception and is probably the biggest victim of MPAA tampering. Most of the kills were trimmed, removing the actual moments of blood and gore, leaving each kill as a joke without a punchline. Every time John Carl Beekler would submit a cut of Part 7 to the MPAA for approval, they would have new notes for cuts that had to be made, leading to the film we have today, which fans have nicknamed The No Blood. There were far gorier films released during the 80s and since that all received R ratings, but The New Blood 
Lot received the treatment it did purely on its reputation as a Friday the 13th movie. The cut death shots only exist today in the form of rough work print footage. The original master of the material was supposedly destroyed for some fucking reason, so an unrated director's cut would be impossible. The deleted footage in its raw form is certainly worth seeking out after a viewing of this film because the deleted kills would have been some of the best in the series, which is a damn shame because part 7 as a film definitely needed all of this shit in the movie to stand a chance. By Friday the 13th part 8, it was clear that the series' creators became tired of battling the MPAA, so that film essentially had no gore to speak of pretty much. The kills were just goofy. <laughs> So let's talk about the finale and get back to the actual plot. You know, the psychic girl I haven't talked about for like 10 minutes. It just kind of says something about how this is pretty much just two movies happening at once where Jason is the villain. One is a typical Friday the 13th movie where it's a birthday party that's gone wrong, and the other is this fucking X-Men psychic bullshit with Tina where she and Nick go all Nancy Drew trying to solve the murders that are happening literally next door that nobody seems to notice. There were like 20 people in that house. How does nobody notice that it becomes emptier and emptier as the film goes along. Anyway, what I really want to talk about is the little diversion where Dr. Cruz and Mrs. Shepard end up pursuing Tina in the dark woods after it comes to light that Cruz had been gaslighting his patient, you know, for fun. Eventually, Jason arrives, cause, you know, this is pretty much his domain, and after a brief chase, Dr. Cruz decides to slow things to a halt because he's always wanted to use a 40-year-old mother as a human shield. Cold-blooded! Don't worry, though, Dr. Cruz gets his comeuppance when Jason Jason emerges with a buzzsaw weed whacker, completely out of nowhere with absolutely no context about where it came from. Jason's pretty much like a video game character where whatever weapons he has just appear whenever they're equipped. <laughs> Dr. Cruz dying looks like he's jizzing his pants. Oh yeah, the final kill. Melissa's murdered, you know, just for being a bitch. Honestly though, she was more evil than Jason could ever dream to be. He should have took some notes from her. From here, Friday the 13th Part 7 is just Tina waging an all-out psychic assault on Jason, and uh, it's mostly just her throwing couches and potted plants at him, with a head on it. <laughs> I mean, there are some cool psychic moments in the mix, and it does feel like Jason has met a worthy match with a supernatural foe in Tina, but really, the highlight in all of this nonsense is seeing Jason unmasked in this film, something John Carl Beekler fought tooth and claw to get in this movie. And it's worth it, because Jason looks gnarly as hell in this film, more pissed off than he's ever looked, and you get the longest extended view of his unmasked visage ever in a Friday the 13th movie. What was once briefly glimpsed is seen plain as day in this film, and he looks fucking cool. Something worth noting, though, is that this is the last film where Jason dons the hockey mask he first nabbed from Shelly in Part 3. After this movie, Jason just wears a replica of his mask he takes in Part 8. Honestly, even though Jason looks cool, he's kind of turned into Tina's bitch. He'll just stand in place pissed off while Tina assaults him with stuff that shouldn't really hurt him that much. He'll allow himself to be doused in gasoline as if he's being sprayed with a high-powered hose during the Birmingham campaign. It just looks like he's getting shot with a squirt gun, but hey. It does lead to Jason being set on fire, which was actually Kane Hodder setting a record for the longest sustained burn stunt in the movie. It looks really convincing. And of course, the house blows up because Jason had a stick of dynamite up his ass. Everything's gone! <laughs> An explosion is an anticlimactic way to defeat Jason, though, who emerges fully intact. No, Jason has to be killed in a weird, bafflingly confusing way where he's pulled in the leg by Tina's father, who directs all of his toxic abuse at Jason as if the murderer was his own wife, confirming in the end that even wife beaters can be redeemed. Now, the father of this film was originally supposed to look actually decayed when he emerges from the lake, but the producer, Barbara Sachs, forced it to be reshot how it is because Beekler went behind her back shooting the finale with the unmasked Jason look that she hated. It calls into question, though, why didn't anyone recover Tina's father's body for burial or cremation? He died near the edge of the lake. It would have been easy to just fish him out, but okay, I guess Mrs. Shepard was counting on her daughter Tina using her dead husband's corpse for some deus ex machina shit. Anyway, the movie is over, John Carl Beekler gets a cameo, and things close out with basically the Halloween 2 ending. Now, there was originally going to be an ending where it's revealed that Jason is still alive in the lake and kills a fisherman, but, you know, it's tradition 
waiting for every Friday the 13th movie to act like it's the last one ever. You know, except for the movie that probably will be the last one ever. That one ended with a cliffhanger. Friday the 13th Part 7 is a fine Friday sequel hurt by its deleted kills and a psychic gimmick that just gets in the way of the Jason in this film, especially such a cool looking Jason. I didn't care about Tina playing a dime store Carrie White. The emotional payoff of Tina's journey in the film is her redeeming the abusive father she killed. It's a weird way to bring things full circle with a zombified wife beating dad turning out to be the good version of Jason Voorhees. You can tell that part 7 could have been an absolutely great Friday the 13th sequel if it was played straight with a totally brutal Jason but with the distracting gimmick, the censorship by the MPAA, and the executive producer meddling with the production. Part 7 is a film that really fights against itself, leaving its true potential unrealized. I give Friday the 13th Part 7 the new blood and undead Tina's dad out of unmasked Jason. Well, before I go, I just want to remind you folks that I have a new review up with Goulash on his spin-off channel, The Gulag. It's a 24-minute review of Scooby-Doo on Zombie Island. If you haven't watched that vid yet, click this card or the link to it in the description below. Also, make sure to subscribe to The Gulag, because the next review will see me forcing Goulash to review Scooby-Doo Return to Zombie Island. <laughs> Finally, I have new merch available on my official TeePublic store, tpublic.com slash user slash Dr. Wolfula. I got designs you can put on t-shirts, face masks, phone cases, bags, whatever. Buy some Dr. Wolfula and Goulash swag today. I command it. Where are you going? <sighs> to take a cold shower. I got a date with a soap on a rope. This video is made possible through the pledges of my Patreon supporters, and I'd like to give a very special thanks to the kind folks pledged to my shoutouts tier. All of the support on Patreon means a lot to me, and it helps my dark influence continue to grow. If you like this video, like it, and if you loved it, click the subscribe and bell buttons for more vids. Be sure to also keep in touch by following me on social media at Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Dr. Wolfula. While I still have your attention, consider pledging to my Patreon to support the channel and get bonus content like previews, VI IP Discord server access, private movie night streams, and credits in videos. Consider pledging at patreon.com slash drwolfula. Also, check out official Dr. Wolfula t-shirts and other merch on tpublic.com slash user slash drwolfula. Thanks for watching. See you all next time. Dr. Wolfula signing out.